Okay, hello everyone. Um, there's probably a few more people still coming into the Zoom space as we get started, but uh, welcome to today's webinar, the adoption of AI technologies in horticulture. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Rose Daniel and I'm the technical manager with APAL. Robotics and artificial intelligence technologies are poised to transform the horticultural practices. So, and with so much technology available, it can be challenging to decide what to use and where to employ it to maximize efficiency and productivity. Today, you'll hear from Dr. Zygmunt Schwab from the Australian Institute for Machine Learning at the University of Adelaide, who will talk about the foundational concepts you'll need to identify opportunities for AI in horticulture and how you can collaborate to take advantage of these possibilities. I would like to introduce Dr. Zygmunt Schwab. Dr. Zygmunt Schwab received his PhD in computer science from the University of Adelaide in 2013 and his master's degree in computer science from the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa in 2009. He's a senior research associate at the Australian Institute for Machine Learning, working at the interface of machine learning, image processing and challenging industry problems. He's also a founder of Insight via Artificial Intelligence, a company that helps organizations develop policies, practices and decisions that are based on the systematic and practical use of prediction machines. Sigmund, it's now my pleasure to hand over to you. Uh, thank you very much. And, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's really wonderful to see such a great interest in the topic and to see so many people um, who want to understand more about how this technology works, what it is capable of. And we really are on the precipice of some major technological changes. Um, and so I'm sort of delighted to be able to speak about uh, this, these types of things today. I'll just dive right in. So since uh, about 1946, um, people who have been doing computing uh, have and been pursuing this idea of trying to make um, intelligent computers. So this whole field of artificial intelligence and machine learning is all about trying to figure out how can we make um, a computer that is smart. But in order to understand what a smart machine is, it's useful to think about what a normal computer is. How does a normal computer work? And what distinguishes a smart computer from a normal computer? And in order to understand that, it's useful to draw upon an analogy. So I'm going to draw upon an analogy of making a cake. Suppose I wanted to make a cake. What I will do is I will generally find somebody who has a beautiful recipe, ask them for the recipe, and then making the cake is literally just a matter of executing each step. I have to just have to collect the ingredients, follow the recipe, and out will come a cake. And normal computer programming is very much like that. So there's some person who's got the human knowledge of how to solve a particular problem, and that human knowledge has been encoded in a kind of recipe that the computer knows how to execute. And if it executes that recipe, it will produce the outcome that uh, is desired. And we tend to say that such a computer program or such a computer is not smart. The reason is that the human knowledge required to actually execute um, the task was effectively coded or encoded fully by the human. So the human had to impart that knowledge by writing down the recipe and the computer just executed it. So what would a smart machine look like? Well, to understand that, let's, uh, let's change the baking analogy slightly. Suppose for a moment that uh, your beloved grandma has passed away and she used to make the most delicious cookies and her beautiful cookie recipe has been lost forever, but you really want to eat those cookies. So what could you do? You have the ingredients, but you don't know how to make the recipe. Fortunately, grandpa is still alive and grandpa remembers what the cookies tasted like. So what you could do is you could try to reverse engineer the recipe. You could go into the kitchen, mix the flour, the water, the eggs, put them in the oven, and then give them to grandpa and he would eat them. And he might tell you, oh, this is too sweet. It's not grandma's cookie. Oh no, this is too sour. It's not grandma's cookie. And so you go back and you mix the ingredients differently and you repeat this process. And at some point in time, grandpa might actually say, hey, you know what? This tastes pretty much like grandma's recipe. Now you don't have a guarantee that you really have recovered grandma's recipe. But what you do have is you now have a recipe that tends to produce things that taste for intents and purposes, just like grandma's did. And now if you imagine that the computer is the one that is trying to figure out how to combine these different ingredients 
in order to produce the output, then we'd say that this is what machine learning is. This is what a smart machine is. Because in some sense, the computer would be the one that's coming up, it's discovering the recipe. And how's it doing it? Well, it's doing it because it's got the inputs, the ingredients, plus it's got this grandpa who serves as the ground troop, who serves as the teacher, who's able to say, yes, this tastes like a good cookie. No, it doesn't. And it turns out that this type of reframing of computer program is extremely powerful. It opens up a, a plethora of new possibilities. Um, a wonderful video that communicates this concept. You ready to start oh, yeah. right now? Yeah, yeah thank you. There, there have been a number of shifts in the way we think about computing over the past few decades. The terminology artificial intelligence has come in and out of favor in the scientific community. Sometimes it's called machine learning. Uh, we tend to call it machine intelligence these days. I just call it intelligence. And sometimes it's just the effort to build machines that are better. So in the early days, everything was built on uh, logic, doing mathematical integration problems, playing chess. But we realized that what the real challenges were, were the things that people can do every day. The real world is actually very messy. Hard logical rules are not the way to solve really interesting real world problems. You have to have a system that will learn to get the knowledge in. You can't just program it all in. Artificial intelligence is an effort to build machines that can learn from their environment, from mistakes, and from people. And we're still at the stage where we don't know what is the right path and the right breakthrough. So, I mean, there's certainly a whole raft of different approaches. One of the subfields we call pattern recognition. Artificial neural network. Uh, reinforcement learning, for example. Statistical inference and probabilistic machine learning. Supervised learning, unsupervised learning. And we're not quite sure what technique is going to lead to better systems. And in fact, it's probably not one technique for everything. It's probably a bunch of different techniques and combinations of those techniques. Any progress we make in building truly intelligent systems is going to depend on progress in technology generally. And until recently, we didn't have computers that were fast enough or data sets that were big enough to do that. And so being able to take a particular problem and spread it out over lots and lots of machines is a very important approach because it makes our research faster. So there's applications of artificial intelligence around us uh, all the time. When it begins to work, or it does work, it's all of a sudden given another name. We're all already using it and very comfortable with it. Things that now we regard as routine, um, 30 years ago would have been regarded as amazing examples of artificial intelligence. Anti-lock braking. Autopilot systems for planes. Search. Recommendations. Maps to decide whether or not this particular email is spam or not spam. The ability to translate one language to another with your phone. 10 years ago, if you tried to talk to your computer or to your phone, you know, that would just be hopeless. We, we are seeing a, a steady torrent of these tricks one after the other getting figured out right now. And I think a lot of people that are close to the field have this uh, do have that kind of breathless sense that things are moving quickly. It's a progressive thing. It's about building things that are slightly better, slightly better, slightly better. Intelligence is really not going to be something that we ever succeed in defining in a succinct and singular way. It's really this whole constellation of different capabilities that um, you know all kind of are beautifully orchestrated and working together. Predicting the long-term future is very difficult. Nobody can really do it. And the bad thing to do is take whatever's working best now and assume the future is going to be like that forever. So I, I feel that you know the very last statement of that, that video is so powerful. The bad thing to do is to take whatever's working now and assume it's going to continue like that in the future. Um, in fact, a lot of economists have been starting to think about um, how is machine learning changing um, industry? What are the economic implications of it? How, how do we rightly construe how this technology disrupts? Um, and so I also have a, a really great video to show you next, a short clip from um, a, three economists from the University of Toronto who really set out to answer this question. They were basically working in an environment where they're seeing a lot of 
artificial intelligence startup companies that are trying to um, disrupt various industries and just try to focus on what is really, what's really, what do they all have in common truly? Prediction is the process that allows us to convert information we have into information we need. Today's machine intelligence is a prediction technology. Wherever prediction is or can be used, advances in AI are lowering costs. But when the cost of any input falls so precipitously, there are two key economic implications. One, we will start to use prediction more often. And two, the value of things that complement prediction will rise. Consider navigation. Until recently, autonomous driving was limited to highly controlled environments where programmers could program if-then-else decision algorithms. It was inconceivable to put an autonomous vehicle on a city street because the number of scenarios would require an almost infinite number of if-then-else statements. But once prediction became cheap, innovators reframed driving as a prediction problem. They outfitted vehicles with a variety of sensors and collected millions of miles of human driving data. By linking the incoming environmental data from sensors on the outside of the car to the driving decisions made inside the car, the AI learned to drive by predicting how humans would react. Therefore, more decisions will need to be made about possible medical treatments, which means greater demand for the application of ethics, emotional support, and understanding of risk. These judgments are made by humans. So the value of prediction-related human skills will fall, but the value of judgment-related skills will rise. As machine intelligence improves, the implications become even greater. On Amazon.com, you shop for items, then Amazon ships them. Most shoppers have noticed Amazon's recommendation engine. At present, it does a reasonable job accurately predicting what we want to buy about 5% of the time. In other words, we actually purchase about one out of every 20 items it recommends. Not bad. But imagine that Amazon AI starts to collect more information, data it finds online, social media posts, and shopping behavior at other stores. Now, imagine the AI uses that data to improve its predictions. At some point, the predictions become sufficiently accurate that it becomes more profitable for Amazon to ship you the goods rather than wait for you to order them. Better predictions will attract more shoppers. More shoppers will generate more data to train the AI. More data will lead to better predictions, and so on, creating a virtuous circle. Interpreting the rise of machine intelligence as a drop in the cost of prediction doesn't offer an answer to every specific question of how the technology will play out. But it yields two key implications. One, an expanded role of prediction as an input to more goods and services, and a change in the value of other inputs driven by the extent to which they are complements to or substitutes for prediction. These changes are coming. The speed and extent to which managers should invest in AI-related capabilities will depend on how fast the changes arrive. For more information, check out our book. And there is one final bit of background information that I think we all need to cover before we really dig our teeth into horticulture and AI. And this is uh, this idea of Industry 4.0 that often arises and what it really means. Because in practice, um, for farming and agriculture, AI systems will require a lot of sensors, Internet of Things technologies, it's a slightly different situation than, for example, the Amazon uh, example, where all the data that is required is almost acquired at the point of purchase. It's all just bits and bytes sitting in the computer straight away. Whereas in farming, you have a slightly different situation. You have to have ways of sensing the world and putting the data in. Um, and people generally call this idea uh, Industry 4.0. So let me show you one last bit of background before we really dive into horticulture. What is Industry 4.0? Industry 4.0 is one of the big buzzwords that is flying around at the moment. 
and it basically refers to the fourth industrial revolution where we've seen transformative technologies that have changed industry. At the moment, this fourth industrial revolution sees smart factories with connected machines and intelligent robots. But how do we get there? The first industrial revolution basically started in the 1770s where we moved from hand to machine, from farms to the first factories using steam and water power. Then a hundred years later electricity arrived in the next industrial revolution. So this gave us automation, it gave us assembly lines. So this was the real start of factories as we know them today. Another hundred years later, we have the computer arrived so around 1970. Um, we now have computers that would allow us to automate some of the blue collar work in factories. We have electronics in them. And this latest industrial revolution, which has just started, which we refer to as Industry 4.0, is now not looking at these individual computerized machines, but this whole network of them. They're all talking to each other. We have intelligent factories. And some of the underlying technologies of this new industrial revolution is the Internet of Things. We have smart machines that have sensors in them that are connected to networks and talk to each other so they can diagnose their own problems and alert someone that something is going wrong within the machines. We have big data, so all of these machines generating huge volumes of data that we can now use and analyze. And we can use things like artificial intelligence and machine learning to make sense out of this data. So we get things like predictive maintenance where a machine or an assembly line will tell us that it might be going to break down in the next day or so. So we need to fix things before they actually ever happen. We now have interconnected supply chains where um, ships are talking to warehouses, they're talking to trucks. It also enables us to have more intelligent robots and autonomous things like vehicle and drones. So this means that we now have ships arriving, the containers can be tracked, the warehouse can be ready even if there's a delay we can now ship things automatically using delivery robots. Um, where I live in Milton Keynes, we now have the Starship robots delivering our shopping. They even deliver the fish and chips from our local fish and chip shops. So they're completely autonomously driving robots that come to our house and deliver things. So this is Industry 4.0, this new world of smart connected machines and intelligent robots that and we, what we basically, what this basically means is that this new industrial revolution means we need to rethink our businesses. We need to take them from the third industrial revolution to this new brave world of industry 4.0. And we need to develop our skills and we need to figure out what the role is of that people will play in all of this. So we're now talking about cobots. So we co-share our working environment with intelligent robots. So we need to make sure that we find a place, a place, a new place for all of us. And this is what I help companies do is, I help them prepare for this new fourth industrial revolution, help them shape their business processes, their business skills, so they can leverage all of these new, new technologies. And like every previous industrial revolution, the organizations that don't prepare for this will very quickly be left behind. If you are a company that makes typewriters, you will be succeed, superseded by someone that makes computers. And in the same way, anyone that doesn't leverage all of this technology will not be as efficient, as effective, they will not deliver smart solutions to their customers and therefore will be left behind. If you would like to learn more, Head to my website at bernardmar.com where you can find tons of articles, white papers and videos that will give you a lot more insights into real world case studies and examples. Now that we know that um, you know, everything is moving towards um, Internet of Things sensors, interconnectivity, what really are the opportunities then in horticulture? So I thought that one way to, to think about it is to start by thinking around 
can we summarize what a farmer or grower is doing currently? And I think that you can, you can reasonably summarize what they do um, in this virtual cycle of three things. They go out and they sense the world. They, you, know, you go out and you look at the apple tree and you see what's happening today. You look at the soil, you look at the weather, you gather information. And then there is this element of thinking, like you, know, you have to make decisions all the time. Um, should I be pouring more water now? Should I be pouring more fertilizer? What's this weird spot on the leaf here? And you have to reach decisions and you're trying to obviously trade off costs um, versus output, etc. And finally, you go and you act in the world. So at some point in time, you've got to go out and, and maybe actually get in the harvester and harvest or send someone out to pull the weeds. And now the thing is that these uh, Industry 4.0 and artificial intelligence capabilities, they actually have the capacity to turbocharge all three of these steps. So for example, there's a, a lot more things you can sense now. Um, with artificial intelligence, uh, image understanding capabilities, you can you know, be flying a drone over your orchard and be um, getting an estimate of the canopy, getting a sense for how much sun it is hitting different parts um, of, your, of your blocks. Uh, you have satellite data you can tap into, et cetera. And generally speaking, there's the sensing, all these various things you can sense, um, they, it all becomes useful training data for an AI system. So it all gets funneled into some kind of uh, computer and whose job it is then to try to discover interesting patterns, try to find relationships between inputs, the sense data, and certain outputs that are observed. Uh, for example, what, what made these plants, these trees grow better than other ones? You, you know, it's, the issue here is that for a human, it becomes very difficult to stay on top of all of the different variables that can come into play, whereas machines have far less trouble with this. And so the idea is that the AI starts becoming like a prediction tool, as was discussed in the other video, where they can start predicting by saying that, hey, if you actually pour a bit more uh, water on this particular tree, uh, that's going to improve the situation by this much. Um, they, so they help you at this decision level support. But nowadays, you even get quite sophisticated um, robotics powered by um, reasoning and uh, route planning and vision that they can even go ahead and start picking uh, automatically. So you can get uh, automatic raspberry pickers or, or pepper pickers, uh, presumably apple ones as well. Um, you have much more intelligent tractors that maybe are even partially autonomous, etc. So if we were to look at um, the, uh, some example benefits, uh, these probably are benefits that are generally true for, agri for agriculture in general. And maybe the first one I've been told it's not so relevant to most people in the audience, but I think it's worth mentioning anyway, just so you're aware of the entire pipeline. That the first um, the benefit or first place where AI can help is at the level of um, seed breeding. So there's a lot of, of course, research being done to figure out what, what how do you actually uh, cross-pollinate different seeds so that you end up with um, fruit that have certain desirable traits, that they grow well in certain conditions. Um, and this is a, you know, this is, comes back to this issue of how do you make that recipe? What recipe um, should one have to get the desirable outcome? And here is where no one really knows what it should be and the computer can try to find a good recipe, a good combination that's going to give the best possible outcome. But the thing that's maybe more directly relevant to a lot of your practices um, are the other points which have to do with, generally speaking, soil fertility, plant protection and management, uh, plant feeding, and harvest. And here by soil fertility, you could imagine having some AI tools that help assess and monitor um, the quality of the soil and how many nutrients it has, potentially in a much cheaper way um, than having to um, you know, actually take the soil sample, have it sent to a lab. Um, there might be a way of interpreting the data that, that's um, much cheaper. You have opportunities around plant protection. Uh, so this is to do, you know, the, the fundamental change here is that you want to move from a reactive maintenance of your orchard to a proactive maintenance. By reactive, I mean that oftentimes, you know, you discover a problem, you wake up to a problem, and now you have to figure out how to resolve it. Whereas with these, if you have continuously instrumented everything and you have a prediction tools, you can very frequently have a proactive management plan. You can sort of be notified of issues that might arise before they even arise. This is particularly true for the case of predicting diseases, um, maybe even identifying pests that are, you know, coming onto your site by having camera systems set up, uh, etc. Um, um, then, of course, plant feeding itself. So the, the real opportunity here, people tend to refer to this as precision agriculture, 
And this is this idea that, you know, by and large, a lot of times farming is done at an aggregate level. Like you, you kind of pour fertilizer and you pour pretty much the same amount almost everywhere, or you have very regular irrigation schemes. But um, it might turn out that the, the AI tool can learn that this particular block has slightly different soil conditions, is performing slightly differently just by the way that the sun's hitting the tree, that you, it can suggest a different mix of irrigation and, fert and fertilization that's most beneficial to that block and a different mix for another one. So you have this, you know, instead of working with coarse statistics, you can get really fine-grained information. And finally, there is, of course, this harvesting aspect. So um, you have these robotic tools that can automate some labor, um, but it's also sometimes, you know, you could have systems that can predict what's actually ripe, what's not. So you can have much more bespoke harvesting. Um, you could, uh, you know, yield prediction is often a huge thing. People want to know how much they're going to have so that they can figure out the logistics downstream. Another thing that's maybe not mentioned here um, is uh, just market surveillance. You know, you could use AI and tap into um, satellite imagery of uh, all the um, uh, all the ingredients that are important materials for you. So you can sort of figure out what's the stock price going to be of um, all my ingredients in the coming months. So you can make better decisions around when you purchase. And actually having highlighted these um, you know, broad stroke ideas, um, we wanted to have the first poll here to say, when you look at this situation and you've heard and you thought about AI, where do you think um, the biggest opportunity uh, or the most value would be for you? Because one of the challenges you have to solve is there are, many, there are many things you could be pursuing. You might ask yourself then, well, hang on, you know, if it's the case that um, these AI tools can do these amazing things, why isn't everyone running an AI-based farm? You know, what's going on? And it turns out that there are you know, several key adoption challenges, and it's good for you to know what they are so you can effectively help lower them and make it uh, much more likely that um, any project that you pursue will succeed. And the first of them, so they're basically data availability, data quality, a clear return on investment, policies and regulations, and social acceptance. And I'm going to talk about each one in more detail. The first one is, um, well, you know, a lot of times the people that are developing um, the capabilities, let's say that I wanted to build a system uh, that can uh, count apples from images. So imagine I fly a drone or I put a camera on your tractor and I can just count how many apples you have. If I wanted to develop such a system, I would need important data. I would need access to images of apples and not images of apples and coals. I need them in the context in the wild, where, how they actually appear in weather, in different weather conditions, with dust, etc. cetera. Um, and a lot of the people who are innovating in the space, well, they're not farmers. They don't have access to this data. And when they want to collaborate with farmers, they can't get going because the farmers just have no way of, of, of they haven't even thought about how they might be able to collect such data. So, so data acquisition is often a huge hurdle. Um, and in fact, a lot of startup companies um, are really looking for people they could partner, farms they could partner with to help co-develop the capabilities. But suppose that you, you even were able to acquire some data, that's not enough. Um, you end up running into this data availability and operability issues. So you'll find that actually on a farm, data is being generated in lots of different kinds of ways. You have human operators who are generating data by virtue of maybe photos they're taking and notes they're making in some system. You've got all your internet of, of, of things sensors that are measuring the moisture, that are controlling the irrigation schemes, and they're, they're producing data at maybe different rates. Um, maybe they're using different metric units. You've got your machines, the drones, the tractors that are, that are communicating and setting information. Um, and it's actually a real challenge to merge everything together. Because if you want to have that, um, you know, if you're going back to this uh, cookie making analogy, um, if you want to train an AI system, if you want the system to, to be able to discover how to make a good cookie, you have to have all the ingredients and you have to have them laid out on the table in a nice orderly manner um, in order for the machine to be able to play with it and discover things. But even if you do all of that, that's still not the end of the story. The other challenge is this ongoing data quality problem. Um, so we call this data preparation. Um, and I guess here's where, where I want to flag is that the, you know, the, the orchards of the future are going to, a lot, going to look a lot more like factories where you actually have to have IT systems. You're going to have to have an IT guy who's going to have to manage some database. Um, of, and make sure that all the data coming in is correct. So 
By data preparation here, we mean like not only do you have to acquire the data, you have to then standardize it. And then there's this annotation step where oftentimes um, you need some domain expert to say something about this data, uh, link the data with some output, um, maybe add some metadata. So there's some human labor involved in that. There are actually some companies that you can outsource this to now where they do this quite cheaply using cheap labor in, in, in the parts of the world where labor is cheap. Um, like for example, with the annotation of apples and images that can be done trivially now quite cheaply. But it's still something to think about that you need, you know, someone working on a project like this is going to have to engage at various levels. Um, and finally, there's this continual quality insurance. So even though you might now have a, a, a various set of sensors, um, you know, maybe the power goes out, they don't reboot properly or they reboot, but the date's wrong um, and all your data could get jumbled up and that's going to confuse the assistant down the line. So you're gonna, you're gonna have to put effort into actually maintaining the data information pipeline that goes into the systems. And that's not trivial. Um, the return on investment is another thing. You know, a lot of people go, well, okay, do I buy this now? And how do I know that I've really benefited from it? And it's not, there isn't a lot of data out there that says Pharma Joe got, you know, this particular system and actually saved $10,000 later. Like that's not easy data to get hold of. But I think that the one way to be thinking about return on investment is along this data decisions um, arrow that I've drawn. You should think about it this way, that you are ultimately making decisions all the time anyway. And the whole purpose of all of these gadgets and gizmos and analytics things is at the end of the day to help you make more informed decisions. So that's where the value is really going. And you have this continuum of capabilities. So the very first thing you have to do that's almost a precedent for anything else is getting situational awareness. So that means instrumenting everything. Instrument as much stuff as you can and then have something like a dashboard where you can log on and you can actually see what's happening on my farm today. How much water have I sprayed, like sprayed today? What percentage of my water budget is that? What is the market price currently for fertilizer, et cetera? Having all of that in front of you in one place already is tremendously helpful to help you make better decisions. But then you continue from there. You know, the next step up could be data analytics. So now it could be, well, I've got these dashboards, I've got this historical data, maybe I can do some unsupervised clustering. I can do some learning to see, maybe the system discovers that, hey, um, this part of the, the, this block and the other block are somehow related. It's similar things tend to happen to them. Maybe it's worth for you to investigate what's going on. So this is almost like a knowledge discovery tool. It can raise your awareness as an owner, a manager of, a, of an orchard to issues that you might not have considered. And as you go further down that line, you start heading towards the prediction aspect where you now really have this huge body of, of historical data um, linked with concrete outputs. And now the system can literally start to predict what is likely to happen when you change the dial on your water meter, when you change the dial on how much fertilizer you put down. But remember, the ultimate purpose of all of this is to help you make a decision. Do I go left? Do I go right? The other thing that um, is often issue is this regulation and policies. And this is where I really encourage you as growers to um, kind of come together. This is where a community effort is really important. Um, if it turns out, for example, that I have this technology or someone's got this technology that um, flies drones over your paddock and can um, count apples and you decide, hey, that's really great. I want to know my yield using that. And then it turns out that there is a government policy that bans um, drones from flying in certain areas. Well, that would be a problem for you, right? So you want to understand um, what capabilities these technologies require. And you kind of want to make sure that, um, that the legislative frameworks or the policy frameworks are in place to help you actually achieve what you need. Um, you, you really want your interests represented. Like this whole thing uh, is predicated upon good internet connectivity. It's predicated upon having data being cheap. Like imagine that you had this smart farm and then for every byte of data that you send, it tells you charges you an arm and a leg. Well, that would sabotage the entire uh, um, uh, endeavor. So you want to make sure that that, that that doesn't happen either. And maybe there's an opportunity for you as a community to influence investments. Maybe there's some way to pool funds to say, we want to support this particular technology. Or we want to support this particular trial. The other thing is to insist on interoperability. I really uh, want to stress that. Like the, you know, the, the worst thing that can happen is that you end up in a situation where a company comes in and it produces product X 
and they lock the products in in such a way that you cannot get the data out to make it talk to product Y. So maybe you want to you, you have the freedom to choose company X's um, water sensor, company Y's barometer, um, and company Z's um, whatever data analysis system, and you lack all of them to be able to talk to each other. Don't get yourself in a position where company X just has a monopoly on everything, and once you get locked in, you can't move. That's just generally really bad. And finally, the, the social acceptance aspect. Um, you know, we, the previous slide said something like, well, are the robots just going to come and take all the jobs? And you know, how, what's going to happen there? Well, I really want to stress that um, the, this whole AI uh, initiative, um, it's not really about trying to automate absolutely every human job's task, every task that a human does. It's, it really is more this idea of having humans and AI work together better. Sure, there might be some tasks that are fully automated, like it might turn out that there is a particular way of picking things where you can have a robot do that. But ideally, that person who used to do the picking would have a new role. For example, maybe they are the person who has to look after the equipment. Maybe they are the person who has to ensure the data quality pipeline. So it's not, you know, the, the thing that you want to do is before you embark on any of these um, projects is you want to get people on board. You want to educate them. You want to educate your own workforce um, and educate the decision makers so they understand what the real capabilities are, what the limitations are. Um, there's a lot of there's this tendency to think of AI as some kind of magic pixie dust, and you don't want to be in that position. The other thing is you want to work on developing a, an AI strategy. So it's not, and this is actually something that you might want to do, again, as a collective, um, as a region. Like, what can we do as a region to make ourselves much more a Industry 4.0 type region? And what I mean here is that it's no point you know, buying a, a water sensor just because it's fashionable, but fashionable now without understanding that, okay, I'm buying this water sensor now, but the reason I'm buying it is for this. In two, three years time, I'm hoping to get this barometer and they have the weather station and these things are gonna to work together to achieve this other outcome. Like you wanna start thinking and mapping out what the opportunities and potentialities are. So it's not just a, like a, a random picking of technologies and trying to put them together. The, the reason as well is that it's really, really important that the very first project that you do is actually a success. So you don't want to be too ambitious. You don't want to go for some, some blue sky, promise you the world that this AI system is going to be everything. Um, because if the moment it fails, you kind of, you know, you're likely to lose trust in the entire enterprise um, and you're never going to go down this path again. And you, you don't want to be in that position. And finally, you should start thinking about building some supporting infrastructure. So as I already mentioned, this entire thing assumes that there is some kind of local wireless network or good internet coverage. It assumes that you have some way of storing all this data, like you've got someone who is at least a little bit computer savvy. Um, you want to be thinking about that moving forward, realizing that if you're going to be the deploying technology, you're going to need people who, can, who are comfortable with the technology, who are comfortable um, tweaking it when it's not working correctly, um, and, and who are passionate about that. I want to leave you with um, one final example, and I'm not affiliated with this company at all. It's just I happened to meet them. They came down from the UK to demonstrate some of the capabilities. Um, they are called Outfield Technologies, and they have developed a product where um, they have a drone that they fly over an orchard, and they count, for example, apples. And the way this technology works is, uh, as you fly the drone, it builds a model of the, of the world, a 3D model of the world, which you can sort of see on the right-hand side. And this 3D model is then processed to search for circular objects, which are basically apples, uh, meant to see how many of them have fallen on the ground, how many I have not, what is the average size and radius, to be able to provide useful statistics that, again, can be fed in to a yield prediction system, or more generally to some kind of system that's trying to understand the relationship between the size of an apple and, and what the weather conditions that were, that were happening a week ago, the amount of fertilizer you put on, et cetera. So that's where I officially would like to end today. Um, I know that it's really just a, a, a small teaser of possibilities. 40 minutes is nowhere near enough to really sink our teeth into um, all the capabilities, but I hope that it's enough to trigger your imagination. Thanks very much, Sigmund. Um, we do have one question. If anybody else has any questions, please type them in using the Q&A um, function at the bottom of the screen. Um, I'll start with this one. It's quite a technical one. <laughs> so um, how, do you know um, how far AI tools are useful in predicting the combination of genes and or alleles for developing optimum high yielding hybrid plants? 
Um, I don't have I don't have concrete data on that. I know that I know that as people are pursuing that, I think that Australian great technologies are looking at this um, capability, um, well, for, for not for apples, like for, for different kinds of seeds. Um, I think so. I believe that the people have had success, but I don't know to what extent. Um, I think it's just still an ongoing area of research. And but I, it's, I guess it's useful to know that. I, wish, I would put it this way, you know, for a long time already, companies have been having models that they've been using so far to be able to predict something. And it's not like they're revolutionizing what they're doing with AI. It's more like they're trying to see whether um, these AI tools can discover patterns that they weren't able to discover before with the tools that they had. Uh, and my kind of suspicion is that that's probably the case. And it's good to see that there are actually some companies doing that. It's not just uh, industry. A place where you'd see a lot of this, of course, would be places like CSRO, uh, et cetera, would be heavily into this type of stuff. Yeah, I'd say there's a lot of work being done in um, next generation sequencing and microsatellites in that sort of um, space as well. Um, it, while we're waiting for other people to type in some questions, we do have an, one last poll if you want to um, respond to that. Um, Sigmund, 80% of the respondents in that second poll indicated that they were ready to invest in technologies. And you started your presentation today with the, the cake recipe analogy, um, which is interesting. We get, um, you know, to put it into the analogy, even in the APAL office, and I imagine the, the growers out in the orchards would be the same. We have a lot of people um, that are startups or developing new technologies come with, with that technology to us. Um, and so I imagine from a grower's perspective, it's quite confusing like to find the right tool to start with, given that you might have 10 different options to choose from. Do you have any tips on how to choose the right tool? So should, should growers be asking for a cost benefit analysis or, or um, like where do you start with so many options? Um, that is an excellent question. Um, you know, I think that you want to be, you want to be filtering, if you have lots of options, you want to start applying some of the filters I mentioned. So the very first filter you want to apply is, okay, how open is your, your, your product? Can I easily get my data out? How have you, ha, is your company planning to interoperate with these other, other people? So I would very quickly filter out the people who are not investing in their products, making them interoperable, I'd call them straight away. Um, and then, the other thing is you want to then see, well, can, can, you, can you pursue some kind of partnership model? So I think a lot of start, startup companies uh, would benefit tremendously if you would say to them, okay, listen, you know, maybe, maybe I'm not going to buy this thing straight away, but guess what? I'm going to let you deploy your equipment on my farm. I'm going to let you acquire data for a year. And, you know, you can sort of use my information, like we can work together. So in other words, I, I think if I would pick the people that are happy to do some kind of partnership, I'd be wary of the people who come to me and just say, oh, I've got the solution, buy this, wham, bam, see you later, um, you know, thank you for your purchase. You want to have people that are uh, kind of uh, see it as a partnership and want to collaborate. Um, um, yeah, and it, I know that uh, Perza, so I know that in, in South Australia, the, there's some organizations, some government organizations that are actually acting as facilitators so when uh, these um, companies came down from, from England, uh, they were basically told that here are, are various growers. I don't think they were in or uh, to do with orchards, but or maybe have been, but basically there's some organization that's actually saying, we can facilitate the relationship. So we bring these companies in, uh, we set up the agreement to say they can use your site for a certain amount of time. You'll be able to get uh, the data yourself. So it's almost like I would suggest a try before you buy approach. Um, that would be really important because you might discover problems um, that are, you know, related to bandwidth issues, to software, like issues that are not directly linked to the water sensor, but are related to it. And you want to have the opportunity to uh, have enough time for those to arise. So, you know, you really want to have a long period of time um, to discover what the limitations of the capability of the technology is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We've got a few more questions coming in on online. So, um, how can we try to fully update an industry that traditionally is slow to react and has the need of high investments for any kind of new step? So, how 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 do you, I guess, encourage grower adoption of these new technologies? Um. Well, gee, that's a <laughs> that's a really beautiful yeah. question. I. Okay. I mean. I would hope that, you know, organizations like APEL, like part of it is like, I can tell you from the, our experience with the Riverland wine region, 
because um, that's a, a group that we've been working with at the, at the university. And there, you kind of need some community, like it's, it's, they've elected some of their peers as being their so-called thought leaders that represent them. And there's somebody who's really spearheading um, the bigger initiative saying, look, we as a region, we need to get ourselves upgraded. They are actually, there's somebody that's designated, that's, that's talking to the companies, that's talking to the universities, that's actually pushing this. And so you, I think that it's, you, you, if you're doing this all on your own separately, it's not as effective as if you come together. I would mention one uh, opportunity that's in the process of forming. Um, there is this a bid by various universities and University of Adelaide, including um, called the Smarter Regions Collaborative Research Center, which is um, basically trying to address a lot of the issues that we're raising today, which is like getting funding uh, from big organizations to actually over a period of 10 years, work with a variety of different growers, uh, work with a variety of different industry providers to make sure that these technologies do get translated. Um, it might be, you know, just joining initiatives like that would be one way because you'd have, it's basically once you join the community, you're part of like a bigger boat, a bigger ship that's sort of moving forward and yeah, that, that's all I can say. I, I don't really have any good um, <laughs> I know one, it's, a, yeah. look, it's, a, it's a, a question that you know has been it's asked a lot <laughs> and it's difficult to answer I, I think actually you know the example that you gave um, earlier about when there are lots of technologies presented and how to make the choice and trying it and having a look and seeing if it works that's part of the adoption process if, it, if, it, if it's proven to work obviously someone is more likely to adopt that as well and um, finally, this is um, relating to greenhouses. Are there new technologies ha happening in greenhouses? Um, maybe just a brief answer if you know anything about that. A new technology is happening in greenhouses. Yeah, something um, more um, that the protected cropping Australia might know a little bit more about. But uh, yeah, I'm not on top of that. Like I, uh, I know that for, I know the, at the university again there was a project to do with um, creating 3D models of the plants as they were growing. Um, so like basically people would set up camera systems around each plant and as the thing is sprouting and growing you have continuous measurements on how big it is etc so you had um, information around certain traits of the plant like phenotyping type things um, that were being again used to for some decision making but I don't know I'm not really um, totally on top of what the latest uh, technologies are I'm I'm sure there's a lot. I think that that that's, ag tech has such become such a big um, area of growth. In fact, agriculture has been identified as like one of the real major adopters of AI in the coming years. Like that's where people think there'll be a huge transformation. Um, you know what? One thing you could consider is um, it's you know even just like starting to browse the net for stuff you can go onto linkedin or you go into like websites you'll find you can start hanging out in forums where people are discussing all these capabilities um, and that's one way to actually start becoming more familiar with what's out there is actively signing up to some newsletters actively for example that bernard marr guy who was plugging himself in the video I showed you i mean a lot of people read his articles he has many good ones and you can sort of see oh yeah this was what's happening in agriculture now this is what's happening in electricity etc but unfortunately, I don't know precise stuff about greenhouses. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, the Protected Cropping Australia might might have a bit more information on that um, in that space. Um, just on that note that you mentioned, agriculture is predicted to be one of the bigger up um, uptakers of um, AI technology and robotics and the like. So a lot of people are concerned about how employment and labour shortages or changes may look as AI. Um, I guess in use of AI and robotics increases in, in orchards and um, pack houses and the like. So if I was looking at, for a career in agriculture, what kind of skills do you think the, the future staffer of an orchard business might um, look at gaining, I guess? Um, I think that, I think that a lot of the skills that they currently gain are still going to be you know, tremendously important because remember, like it's, it's not like you're going to automate away the farmer himself, right? It's, we're talking about very specific, it, it's kind of funny, like that it's, it's actually hard to automate the really cheap labor. Like for example, someone cleaning, um, like someone that's just cleaning stuff, right? It's actually very hard to build a, a, a robot that can vacuum your car because there's a lot of fine motor motions, movements involved in that. Um, 
And so a lot of the manual, the really manual labor tasks are not that easy to automate. It's actually, it's actually really hard, those fruit picking robots, um, it's hard to actually make them work properly because especially when they're not in a, a like in factories, everything is enclosed and you control the weather, you control the climate. You put the robot out on the paddock, suddenly it's rusting, suddenly it gets struck by lightning, suddenly dust goes into it. And so it's actually, ironically enough, proven tremendously hard to replace the person pulling the weed out of the ground or replace the person picking the fruit. So I don't think that you know, there is this pending doomsday scenario for all the pickers. Um, moving forward, though, I do think that you want to have some, some kind of you don't want to be comfortable with IT and infrastructure. You, know, you want to have someone who, who's getting into agriculture who says, oh yeah, I know what a database is. Oh yeah, I, I, can, I can work with spreadsheets. I can export the data. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable picking up this Internet of, sens sen Internet of Things sensor, plugging it in, fiddling with it. Um, I think those people are going to become important because as I was mentioning that you end up with the situation where you have all this technology and someone's got to manage it. You know, it's, it's someone's going to reboot it, um, et cetera. So I think you want to have a bit of that. No one's asking you to become some math guru or some stats guru or anything like that, because you're not, you're not the one trying to create the technology. Um, you just want to use it more effectively. But it does mean that there's going to be more engineering type things on your farm. So you need to have people who are capable of managing that. Okay. No, that's um, uh, probably a good point to, to finish. Thanks very much, Sigmund. That's all the questions and um, discussion we've got time for today. If you've got anything else that you would like to discuss with Sigmund, please follow up with him directly or contact the Australian Institute for Machine Learning at the University of Sydney. We can provide you with contact details for Sigmund if you um, need those. Thanks very much, Sigmund, for taking the time to join us and sharing all your research outcomes and insights. It's a pleasure. Thank you all for joining in and for the invitation. Um, for those of you who participated today, you can find the presentations in the Future Orchards Library on the APAL website, and a recording of the webinar will be available in a few days. Thank you very much for participating. We'll be conducting a short evaluation survey at the end of the webinar, and it would be great if you could just take a couple of minutes to complete that. There'll be a, a box, a pop-up box to direct you to that survey um, as we finish. I'd also like to acknowledge Hort Innovation because this webinar has been funded by Hort Innovation using the Apple and Pear Industry R&D levy and contributions from the Australian government. APAL has a few more webinars coming up over the next few months and you can see a summary of those here. And um, you can also find more information about those and register for them under, on the APAL website under the events tab. If you've got anything else that you're particularly interested in hearing about, please let us know. Um, and before you go, I'd like to um, remind you that we are also running a data collection um, as part of our future business program. The team are collecting um, insurance related data to understand how much businesses are paying for insurance and what type of coverage everybody has. We're encouraging small to medium sized businesses to, to participate in the data collection process so that we can better understand and advocate on the industry's behalf, because it may mean that a better a better premium through utilising a group buying deal. And participation in the data collection process doesn't mean that you're bound to the outcome. It's purely to understand whether we have a high or low incidence of claims and how much businesses are paying for insurance. The data collection closes at the end of July. So if you're interested, please get in touch with Rochelle. You can find her contact details at the bottom of the slide there or um, call the APAL office and they'll put you in touch with her directly. In the meantime, thanks for participating today. Stay healthy and we look forward to seeing you next time. See you later.